time for Wednesday's hour number two on Hashtag Daily K with your host, Peter Bint. Korean dramas, movies, and even lyrics. Why is the world paying attention to Korean stories? From classics to modern masterpieces, time to dig deep into the charms of Korean literature. On Check It Out with Paul. Every Wednesday at this time, Paul comes in with this jaunty music and dances his way into the studio very elegantly. Mr. Matthews, how are we this 13th of September? I'm doing well. Lucky for some, lucky hopefully. For some? It's oh. the 13th, but it's well, not a Friday. Do you have a lucky number? Uh, it's uh, 010555. <laughs> Call that and all your dreams come true. What story are we going to be doing today, Paul? Okay, no insects for you, but I do have some food. It's another free Ooh. online short story today, courtesy of the web archives of Brother Anthony and Sonjay. You can mm-hmm. find this online for free if you want to read it. It's called Guksu Noodles, and it's by Kim Sum. And it's a story, I think, for families and also for foodies, especially for those who maybe have had a little bit of a tense relationship, especially sort of between child and step parent. Oh, okie dokie. So there's more to it than just the food there. Interesting. Uh, we are a nation of noodle lovers. And because I've read ahead in the script today, we'll talk about that in part three. Yeah. Yeah, I've done my homework, haven't I? For the first, is this the first time? Could be, could be the first time time ever. Um, Okay, so noodles. Uh, We've got the author Kim Sum. Does that ring a bell? I'm trying to be honest. It should do. We featured definitely rings a bell. One of her novels before, a really impactful novel uh, called One Left. Uh huh. And this is. Uh, a piece of fiction about comfort women, but it was based on the testimony of <gasps> comfort women. I do remember. Um, it was her first novel to be published in English, mm-hmm. um, and it was really impactful. I highly recommend it, though I will say it is triggering. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very traumatic and tragic book. Wow. Um, she's a brilliant author. She was born in 1974 in Ulsan. She studied social welfare at Daejeon University, uh, but she was also writing on the side. She sort of started writing when she was in high school, made her debut in the late 90s, won the Daejeon Ilbo Prize for one of her stories, and she's gone on to be a big prize winner. She's published uh, at least nine novels and six short story collections. And uh, I think it's a pity we don't have more of her work in English. Mm. Fortunately, thanks to Brother Anthony's online archive, yes. we can look back at these short stories that were printed in various magazines that he Fabulous. translated and get a different look at an author we featured before. Brother Anthony of Tez, uh, we have talked about many times, been doing great stuff here in translation for decades, right? Yeah, f- uh, something like uh, 40-something years in Korea. Wow. Um, and he's been publishing uh, poetry and then novels and short stories uh, all through that time. Um, he mostly translate poetry, but we've also seen him translate mystery thrillers, mm. but also historical fiction as well. Um, I really appreciate the fact that he's got such a breadth of work. And also, if you go to his website, if you search for Brother Anthony mm. Korea, go to his website. There's so much of his translated uh, short story and poetry work online. Oh, nice. For free. Uh, yeah, especially Brilliant. the stuff that is out of print. Uh-huh. And I think he doesn't do it for the money. Mm. He does it because he wants to share Korean culture and Korean literature and Korean poetry. Wow. And I really appreciate the fact that, you know, he's sort of, putting it all out there, saying, it's here if you want it, yeah. here's an archive. Come get it. Um, the story, we're going to get to our first reading from the actual translation. Any scene setting needed? Well, it's all about making noodles, and we'll start at the very beginning. Needed was a pun there, by the way. Deliberately. Anyway, listen up. <laughs> Right. Now it's kneading time. A time when I have to add water to the lightly mounded flour. One, two, three, four spoonfuls at a time, mixing it in and moulding it into a lump of dough. A time when I have to mix and knead until the lump, rough-skinned as a blistered heel, grows smooth like a baby's face coated with milk lotion. I have to give it a vigorous massage. 
I had just been rummaging in the kitchen cabinet, trying to find some perilla oil when I came across a bag of flour. The moment I glimpsed the four kilogram bag, its top sealed by a twist of yellow rubber band, I found myself seized by an urge to boil up a serving of noodles made with my own hands. Kneading the dough, rolling it out, slicing out noodles one by one. At once, I took a large brass bowl and poured the flour into it from the bag. I shook the bag until it was empty. There looked to be enough flour for three or four bowls of noodles. I could not guess how large a lump of dough that amount of flour would yield, or how many strands of noodles I would produce. If the bag of flour had not caught my eye, hunched there behind the packs of seaweed and glass noodles like some neglected old man, I suppose I would now be boiling up some rice gruel. After pouring a handful of soaked rice into a saucepan and stir-frying it in perilla oil, then adding the water saved from washing the rice, I would be stirring it with a rice paddle to keep the grains from sticking to the bottom of the pan until they began to come bubbling up. Grains of rice rising like futile thoughts. All of them. I am waiting for the grains of salt to dissolve in the water. The grains of salt that resemble grains of sand have settled to the bottom of the drinking glass and show no sign of dissolving. In the glass, which is stamped with Chilsung cider, the water is quite still. The salt may be melting, moment by moment, but far too slowly for my inept, impatient eyes to be able to see. Until the grains of salt have vanished without a trace, am I supposed to wait forever? absent-mindedly? To do that, with the time remaining, I finally take a spoon from the box. Using a spoon with a phoenix stamped on the handle, I stir the water in the glass. It must measure about five centimeters across. In the narrow glass, a whirlpool forms and the grains of salt rise upward around and around. As I stare into the vortex, I start to feel giddy. I have the sensation I'm being sucked into a powerful eddy. Little by little, parsimoniously, I pour in the water, wherein the salt grains are finally dissolved and blend it with the flour. The flour grows damp, clumps roughly, sticks to my fingers. Rubbing the flour between my clenched fingers, I shape it into a lump, pressing until the joints of my fingers bulge like bulbs, using my fingers to scrape off the wet flour that is inclined to stick to the basin like chewing gum. Perhaps I had some vague premonition that one day a time like this needing time would come to me, a time, I mean, when I would have to endure while I keep clenching and spreading my sluggish fingers. The kitchen window full of afternoon sunlight, like a squashed persimmon, sitting like this, my back turned indifferently to the window. Uh very detailed description of all the cooking and getting ready to make the noodles <sighs> i don't know what's going on is this a cooking cookbook we could do cookbooks as well no it's not a cookbook but it's it's her stream of consciousness right. as she does this okay and um as we get into it we learn more about her and why she's making these noodles why she has this needing time or whether she needs time oh very good you can really feel like you're in a korean kitchen almost talking about yeah. the packs of seaweed the glass noodles exactly the, flour, the chilsung cider bottle as well uh, yeah not to mention brand names though no um <laughs> it feels like she's also putting a lot of effort into it but mm. she's not very good at it she's mm. not used to doing it and it, she seems to be talking to someone in her mind yeah. as she's doing it uh, and she needs the dough. And as she needs, we get these memories coming to her. And she looks around the kitchen. And this is a kitchen that's familiar to her. Uh -huh. It's not her kitchen. Um, and she thinks of the actions that have happened there. And she also feels like almost as if she's done this regularly, even though she hasn't. Oh, It feels so familiar in many ways. Interesting. Maybe someone close to her has done this. Yeah, quite possibly. Mm. And she needs more. And as she needs the smell of noodles cooking comes to her mm. and she starts remembering the noodles from her childhood oh. in fact specific noodles made by her stepmother uh -huh. on the day her stepmother arrived in their home oh wow really a vivid memory yeah. remembering it was that day and she's the one she's talking to in her mind as well ah. so her stepmother was 43 back mm. then now her stepmother is 72 and the narrator is 43 oh 
And so it feels almost cyclical, mm. going around in these cycles. She was only a, you know, a teen at the time. And she remembers that day when her stepmother came, the very first day when she made the noodles and how she was angry and how she cut up these noodles with a spoon, sort of destroying the hard work of her stepmother. Ah, a bit of rebellion. Yeah. And she wonders why she did that. And she mm. continues kneading. And then she starts thinking about her stepmother's tongue. And how it hurts so much she had to stop eating noodles. As she... in her words? No, as in her actual oh. tongue. Oh. She has cancer. Oh, no. Okay. Um, and how her stepmother called her in the middle of the night one time, begging for her tongue to be cut off. Cut oh, off. dear. And she thinks of the time they went to the hospital and had hours of tests and then went to a restaurant and ordered noodles afterwards. Mm, it's all a noodle theme. Yeah. And then she thinks... of the two times in her life when she really longed for her stepmother's noodles. Oh. And she thinks of the one time, the only time her stepmother came to her house after she was married Just to visit. Just one time? Just once. And she thinks about that occasion. Let's hear about it. You came to visit my house only once, right? It was in my eighth year of marriage, when I was in bed recovering after losing the baby I had been pregnant with by AI, after all sorts of difficulties. My husband contacted you as he was leaving for a few days, away, working in Busan. The next day you took the bus at dawn and arrived at my house. I said I wanted noodles to eat. So you kneaded flour into dough in my messy, unfamiliar kitchen and made noodles, crouching huddled beneath the table just as on the day you first came to us, making broth with a chicken, cooking the noodles in that, slicing thin strips of the flesh, seasoning them with sesame oil and perilla seeds, using that as a garnish. Chicken noodle broth that seemed sure to act as a tonic if only I consumed one bowlful. You served it up with water kimchi you brought from home in place of a sauce. If you wait quietly, one will come. If you just wait, it will come naturally. After you left, I flushed the bloated noodles down the toilet. Before even the elevator carrying you had reached the ground floor from the 15th, cursing your fate and mine. Flushing and flushing until the toilet had swallowed up every last strand. In that way, I was transferring to you the blame for my not having a baby. Blaming you, with whom I had not a drop of blood, not a scrap of flesh, not a sliver of bone in common. Perhaps because I wanted to believe that your fate had taken control of my fate. Just as two strands of noodle that should stay separate somehow stick together as they cook and form a lump. Your fate and mine seem to have clumped together. If I wait, you said. Perhaps it was because I learned far too early that there were sometimes things that do not come, no matter how long when waits. My mother setting off for the house of her brother who ran a dry cleaners. Mother had said she would be back before evening, and though I waited, she never came back. I waited as the evening grew ever deeper, festered, ready to burst, until day dawned bright just as mold blooms on a festering spot. On the day you came to us, too, I think I spent the whole day waiting for Mother. It simply seemed that if I only waited, Mother would come back alive, if I waited earnestly. And I think I spent all the time you were in charge of us in place of Mother waiting for Mother. That might be why I never once called you Mother. While I had striven to repudiate you and keep you at a distance, it seemed that if I ate a bowl of the noodles you had prepared, My body that had so pointlessly expelled the baby would somehow recover. Noodles with clams, noodles with red beans, noodles with potatoes, noodles with dumplings. There are all kinds of noodles, but even one bowl of the exceedingly plain austere noodles you prepared. That rolling pin you left behind in my kitchen. When we moved house, I left it behind.
So all these memories, painful ones, intertwined with yeah. the noodles. Seems like they have a complicated relationship. Well, at least this way, it seems, from the stepdaughter's point of view. And leaving behind that and flushing down the noodles. Just, it seems like she's trying to push her away. But doesn't yeah. really want to at the same time. It's a bit complicated. It is. And, and I think now she's looking back on how she behaved, on her behaviour. Mm. And I think she knows that what she did was wrong. And she's actually sort of disappointed with herself or upset or maybe even appalled at herself. And okay. the way she behaved. But she's trying to process all these complicated emotions. Mm. And this is, you know, this is a years on. Um, and it's clear that... You know, a stepmother can never replace a mother, especially a mother who suddenly hmm. disappears and dies. Yeah. And so she does care for her. And she talks about how she's worried about having to tell her stepmother that the doctor says she's going to need surgery oh, on the tongue. Oh, dear. So that's why she's here. Okay. But to sort of delay that, she's making the noodles. Mm. And she's worried about whether the noodles are going to be okay, whether she can actually make them properly. Mm. And she doesn't have enough time to rest them properly before she has to head back to Seoul. Because oh. normally you'd rest them for hours and hours. Okay. Um, and she hasn't told her stepmother that she's also trying AI, artificial insemination, another time. Oh, wow. You know, even though she's now in her early 40s, she's oh. giving it one last go. And then she remembers the sauce. Uh -oh. She hasn't prepared the sauce. <sighs> Has to go to the store to get the ingredients. And then she remembers when she went to get her family register certificate mm. and noticing her stepmother not even being on that. Ah. And that her mother is already buried next to her father. Mm. And they've never once considered, never once asked her stepmother where she wants to be buried. Uh, seeing things from maybe her point of view. Yeah. And she thinks of how this woman, her stepmother, no blood relation, brought up four children, none of whom were her own. Mm. And how they discovered on her 70th birthday, they took her out for Shabu Shabu. Uh -huh. She'd never had Shabu Shabu before. Oh. And then they discovered there were so many different foods she'd never <gasps> tried. Oh. And then she rolls out the dough and she's cutting the noodles and she feels like she just wants to crush them and crumple them all up together. But no, she quickly puts them in the water, okay. gets them cooking, and they dance in the water. <laughs> And it feels like it has taken so long to make this dinner, that it has taken an age. Mm. And that will take us to the very end of the story oh. as the noodles are cooking. It does feel like a lot is going on in this cooking of one meal. While I kneaded the dough, cut up the noodles, then boiled them, much time seems to have elapsed. Not just three or four hours, much longer than that. It seems people began making and eating noodles around 2000 BC. Traces have been found in the Yellow River Basin. The oldest datable evidence of the existence of noodles, apparently. I remember hearing that those noodles were made with sorghum flour, not wheat. From 2000 BC until now, a period of time too long to calculate seems to be contained in one bowl of noodles. I suppress a longing to improve things with a sprinkling of egg garnish. From the beginning, I wanted to offer you a bowl of noodles no different from those you first served us. Noodles no simpler and no more ornate than your noodles. Clasping the table, with nothing but the boiled noodles and the sauce on it, I cross the kitchen threshold. As the edge of the table touches the sliding door, the opaque glass shakes. You must have woken up at some point. You were sitting forlornly to one side of the room. Perhaps you have been awake all the time. The sound of the grains of salt melting in the water, the sound of rubbing and kneading as I poured the salty water into the flour, the sound of the dough being pounded, the sound of the cutting board shaking and banging while I was rolling out the dough. The sound of the dough folded like a diaper being sliced with the kitchen knife. The sound of the noodles boiling. The sound of the table's four legs being unfolded. Perhaps you heard all those sounds without saying a word. Why? You've cooked noodles. Smoothing your disheveled hair, you approach the table. Holding the spoon, you scoop up the sauce and transfer it to the bowl of noodles. You stir it around in order to mix it evenly. 
Changing to chopsticks, you stir again a few times, then lift up some noodles. Five or six strands dangle from the chopsticks as you raise them. Before you can open your mouth, the noodles you have labored to pick up slip off. Even the last, barely remaining strand finally falls from your chopsticks. After all, it looks as though your tongue is not up to the task of dealing with the noodles. So I pick up the spoon. I begin to snip and cut the strands, just as I did long ago to the first noodles you ever served to me. Only my feelings then, and my feelings now as I snip at the noodles are clearly different. Snip, snip, snip. Some very complex feelings here, different feelings in the same situation where the role's not been reversed, but well, yes, they have been reversed. Oh, she's like, oh, I see, like she's almost going to a childlike state, I suppose, yeah. having to be cared for. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, and this is the end. Yeah, this is it. We don't, we don't know what will happen to them, but it does feel like a resolution. It does feel like a, a very fitting ending. Okay. The snip, snip of the noodles that uh, echo the way that she cut up those noodles back when her stepmother first arrived oh, well, all those years ago. different feeling behind them now. Yeah. Like having to take care of her stepmother. And like you said, maybe realising that she was a bit harsh in her behaviour. Oh, more than a bit harsh. Very harsh. Years, yeah. Just being a petulant child. Mm. Um, and what's what I love about this story is that there's a conversation, but no conversation. Mm. It's a conversation with oneself. There's no dialogue that we get from the other side. No, really. there's just one line here or one line there, and that's yeah. it. And it's this lifetime of anger and worry and guilt and shame, not just on the narrator's part, mm. but I think on a stepmother's part ah. as well. And they're unconnected by blood, but they're connected by family, and they're both childless, oh, but yes. maybe that's she's actually going to have a child. Maybe uh -huh. she's going to break this cycle. Okay. Um, I think it's brilliant. I think it's a really great short story. It takes it takes its time, mm. like that first reading you, you said. Is it a cook? Is yes. it a cooking book? <laughs> um, but it because it it gets you into that mindset, mm. and also it gets you into the slog and the grind of women's work traditionally, mm. which I think is really important. It tells us so much about the sacrifice traditionally of women in Korean families, yeah, and how much that process, yeah care, the love, the dedication that goes into something that people take for granted. A bowl of noodles, yeah. that's not your high-class, highfalutin steak and chips. <laughs> this is your everyday food. Yeah, and yeah, I suppose that's why the older generation, my mum included, kind of is a bit rebellious against all these easy fixes, you know, yeah. ready-made meals and going out to eat. She kind of feels like well, that completely misses the point of, mm. like, eating. You're meant to put your heart and soul into it and stuff. And, yeah, I think maybe the younger generation, what they do wrong is they underappreciate And they're like, no, 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 we don't have to do that. You know, that's why we live in this modern society. I sometimes tell my mum, let's go out to eat, you know, or mm. let's eat this instant pack of noodles. And she'll be like, no, I want to make it. Like, that's how I've done it my yeah. whole life. And Look, I'm going to disagree with your mum about going to restaurants. <laughs> I think going to a good restaurant is fine. Yeah. I think going to a cheap franchise <laughs> where everything is made in a factory is mm. not good. Yeah. But what I do agree with your mum on is the home cook thing. I know some people don't have time, yeah. but the the taste difference mm -hmm. between a homemade meal and something that comes out of a packet in a fridge <laughs> in one of those um, unmanned stores yeah. where you just swipe your credit card and <laughs> take what you want. In Korea, we have the term sonmat, mm. which literally translates to the hand taste. Yes. But, it, but it's the taste that comes from handmade food, the sure. love and the care that goes into it, and especially with noodles. Mm. Um this is not so much, a, it's a Korean dish, but it's not a Korean dish. If mm. I talk about chajangmyeon, yeah. which is the black bean noodles you find in Chinese restaurants in Korea. Yeah. There used to be a restaurant I went to uh -huh. where they had a guy who would stand in this little windowed <laughs> box outside the restaurant and spent the whole day making noodles. So you could see that because it's yeah. quite impressive. It is. Well, it's yeah. fascinating to watch. And, um, and the noodles were so delicious. Oh. And I would go there literally twice a week <laughs> to have the chajangmyeon yeah. because it was so tasty. And then he broke his arm. Oh, no. Yeah, had an accident. Uh -huh. And they never replaced him. Oh, dear. And the food never tasted the same again. They started using bought-in noodles. Oh. And it didn't have that taste. Yeah. Um, so yeah. noodles mean a lot to me as well. 
I'm very picky about yeah. my noodles. Yeah, in Korea, noodles, you know, a bowl of rice, we've often said on the show, you know, that's the staple. If you don't have a bowl of rice, a lot of Koreans will say you haven't eaten a meal yet. Yeah. But noodles hold this kind of place in Korean psyche. I don't know what it's akin to in, like, British cuisine, but, like, as a child, you're often looking forward to noodles. Those yeah. were a bit of a treat, I suppose, a bit less common. But they're also very common at the same time. There are so many different varieties. Sure, but they're also cheap. Mm. When rice was scarce mm. and you only had flour and water, it was much easier to make noodles. Yeah. It takes more effort. Mm -hmm. I think the equivalent uh, in the UK would be toad in the hole. Oh, okay. Because toad in the hole, for those who don't know, it's, um, it's a batter mm -hmm. that's uh, cooked with oil in the oven and rises and puffs up yeah. and becomes chewy and crispy. And you put a couple of sausages in there. Yes. Uh, and maybe some onion gravy and that's it. Mm. And that is really cheap to make uh, because it's flour, it's water, it's salt, it's okay. maybe an egg or a little bit of milk and a couple of sausages and that's it. Uh, and then it becomes this big dish for the whole family and to share. And it fills share. you up. Ooh. That's the thing. I and like noodles, it. I think, noodles and sujebi, mm. which are these hand-pulled um, bits of noodles, as it yeah. were, um, I think play a really big role in traditional family and traditional food, and we shouldn't forget them. Yeah, it's kind of sad. Like I don't think there are too many young couples where either the male or the female will be making noodles at home. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think you have to make the noodles <laughs> at home. You can buy good noodles. But what mm. I will say, if you come to Korea and you think the only noodles you should be eating are lamian, uh -huh. you are very much mistaken. I will say, do eat the ramen as well. I am a fan. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with lamian. But one, yeah. it's unhealthy. Sure. Two, it's not good quality. Sure, they're not real they're, noodles No, they're like cheap. This. They're cheap factory-made, dried-out fried noodles. Yeah. Whereas if you go to a proper noodle restaurant, and there are some great ones in Seoul and all around the country, yeah. um, you know, whether you have your kalguksu, your knife cut noodles in a bowl of soup, whether mm. you have your chanjiguksu, the very thin noodles that are served at wedding parties and so on. Oh, they're good. Or whether you have your cold buckwheat noodles, you know, your, yes, your nebilguksu. Yeah, nengmyeon as well, that's good. Or pibim nengmyeon. Yes. Whether you have your noodles in a cold icy broth or whether you have them cold with a spicy sauce. Noodles are a big part of Korean life. And I know we say bap mogoseo, yeah. but sometimes I want to say myeon mogoseo. Myeon kuksu. Yeah, there are two words for that as well, which we didn't even scratch the surface of today, Paul. Thank you for that story. Real kind of thinker that grows on you. What's your one-line review? A powerful meditation on family, life, forgiveness and care, all centred around a simple bowl of noodles. I will forgive you if you buy me a bowl of noodles, Paul. Uh, thank you so much for your beautiful reading. Uh, thanks to everyone. Thanks to the Literature Translation Institute of Korea for their help with copyright permission always. Thanks to Kim Soon for her story and to Anson Jay for his excellent translation. Next week, I've got another book. It's Three Days of Autumn by Su Jung In, translated by Jamie Chang. Three Days of Autumn. Uh, and I'll see you then. You can listen to Check It Out with Paul Matthews on Adidang Radio's Hashtag Daily K every Wednesday from 10am KST.